All right, friends, as you heard, we're talking about fashion, which is kind of rare on this podcast. And it's unfortunate because Dan and I, we're enthusiasts. We love talking about clothes. Yeah. It's probably what? Watches, cars, technology, clothes. That's the basis of our Gotta friendship. Got to put food in there somewhere. Oh, food. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Another Food's big Food's number one. zero. Yeah. <laughs> That's just like, you know, assumed by yeah. our listeners. But anyways, yeah, we're talking about fashion. Specifically, we're talking about this team at MIT that's working with a fashion company on this like next generation of fabrics. Now, really quickly, this company that they're working with is called the Ministry of Supply, and it's got a fun little story. Ministry of Supply was founded in 2012 by MIT students. It was actually a Kickstarter that they, um, they initiated after, I think, a summer of research with the goal of creating the best possible dress shirt. They were aiming to have a, uh, a dress shirt that didn't really wrinkle, that was good at regulating temperature. And it looks like the knit they came up with was very similar to what NASA was using um, for their temperature regulating materials that's used in spacesuits and whatnot. So anyway, they had this Kickstarter. It did really well. Um, it grew from just being you know dress shirts to clothing of all sorts. And they're very... I guess they're on the leading edge of materials within the clothing industry, within fashion. And the idea they're working with, with the MIT researchers is smart fabrics, as in not like sensors embedded in it, but fabrics that can mold to the wearer's body instead of using this, you know, four size fits all. You got small, medium, large, extra yeah. large. So it's it's a pretty interesting concept. Um, and I, I like the origin of it because, you know, you and I always talk about how like we like to have a minimalist wardrobe, not just because, you know, we, we don't want to overwhelm ourselves with options, but it's also good for the planet. Mm -hmm. It's good for your wallet, you know, and, uh, these folks are trying to combat this massive trend within the fashion industry, which is, you know, ultra fast fashion or fast fashion in general, that leads to a lot of waste that leads to, um, you know, people ditching their clothing because it's just not out of style or the size doesn't fit anymore. Well, and I think that's probably the main thing is a lot of people, they end up, and myself included, right? I would, I am an, I would say I'm aspirationally a minimalist with my wardrobe. Um, and I think, man, if I find a couple key things that I know are reliable, I know are durable, and I know fit perfectly, I would love to make those my main rotation and yep. then, you know, not be super exorbitant and keep buying extra stuff but the challenge is i'm having a hard time finding stuff that's like always reliable always durable last you know stands the test of time and also fits perfectly right that that's a pretty hard um you know the, the, the area yeah the area where those venn diagram the circles in the venn diagram overlap is pretty pretty small so i like a lot what these people are talking about because they're talking about using cutting edge technology in the textile space and in the robotic space to kind of, I guess, cause some sort of type of awakening or innovation in the fashion space um, that not only allows us to minimize waste, like you mentioned, but then also basically democratizes or potentially democratizes like a perfect tailored fit but it uses technology to make that accessible to a lot of people. And I think we've talked about getting like made to measure clothing yeah. and I, I bought made to measure suits and that's what I wore uh, when Nellie and I got married and I had a pretty decent experience with that. Um, but I think this even overcomes a lot of the challenges that people have with that. Where For like sure. Some inconsistencies in measuring or in manufacturing. Um, we're, we're kind of beating around the bush here, but I think it's really interesting how this team from MIT and Ministry of Supply are coming together to like take a lot of cutting edge tech that we saw in textiles, a lot of cutting edge tech that we see in robotics and in design software and kind of weave those together. Oh, yeah. weave. That's it. Cause, cause they make a woven fabric here. We <laughs> weave those together um, to create this fabric that is able to be manufactured in a, a smart, uh, smart way and then the secret sauce i would say is the post treatment of mm -hmm. the fabric where they're able to change and modify the shape of the of a garment using heat so the the 
punchline there, I think, that they mentioned is like they, you know, stores might only have to keep one or two sizes per SKU per item in stock, right? Which allows them to reduce their waste, which allows them to sell these items to a lot more people without worrying whether you've got um, this certain specific size on the shelf. And then they use heat to help it tailor to fit the fit every single person perfectly. And one of the things that they mentioned is, you know, if you and I both wear a size large shirt, that doesn't mean that we're actually the same size. Um, and that that's one of the misnomers they think is like everyone thinks everyone fits into a t-shirt mm-hmm. size, but truly every single body's different. And in this way, they're able to kind of create between their computerized knitting, which is like a really smart sewing machine. Um, and the robotic heat activation basically make every single person have a garment that fits them perfectly and you don't need to put them in a bucket like you're a size large or you're a size medium or you're a size small. Yeah. And from the perspective of the manufacturer, right, um, one of the biggest challenges they have every season is what is like what is the range of sizes that we need to include with all these new products we have coming out and predicting how much the manufacturer of every size for every SKU. They don't want to over manufacture because if they do, then it's going to go on clearance and it might not sell and end up in a landfill, which is bad. And I think for a lot of the manufacturers, what they really don't want to do is under manufacture where they have a lot of demand for specific sizes and they just simply do not have those anymore. So this approach allows you to be as inclusive as you can possibly be while minimizing the risk of producing um, because now you're not worried about the different sizes. Um, I, I I really want to, I'm fascinated by this heat treatment process. Um, you, you already mentioned it, but they have this woven fabric, this knit that is composed of a material that reacts to heat and therefore shrinks in shape. Mm -hmm. Um, and we, we we mentioned, uh, ministry of supply, but they're working with the MIT self-assembly lab. Just quickly wanted to know. They actually have years of experience working with dynamic textiles. They have two well-known projects. One was the dynamic sweater, which could like shrink or fit to you depending on how you would like that during the uh, the cold season. And then they had masks when COVID was at its peak to make sure it's fitting right to your face. That's pretty sweet. Pretty sweet. Um, but the, when they were talking about the clothing, you know, obviously they had have this demo, which I really suggest everyone to go and check out. It's like a minute and a half video. Super cool to see it in action. You see this demo of an off the rack dress, then fit it to the person. And you're like, wow, that's that fit is out of this world, which I think is great. But as a man who like does a lot of suit shopping, like you said, the large for t-shirts is kind of annoying because like I might be in that realm of sizes, but it might not fit perfect, but it's okay because it's a t-shirt. But suits, you're spending so much money. And if it fits even a little bit, you know, not correctly, it really shows. Mm-hmm. So where my mind quickly went is, oh, it would be great if I could just put on pants and, you know, sometimes I might need the waist to be completely tailored in, but I want the legs to be a little bit looser and then fine tuning that heat treatment to exactly what I want. So not even like one specific fit to exactly what that customer wants out of the profile for the rest of their um, attire. That's that's the biggest like advantage of this process. No, me. I agree. And I think we've kind of. I want to do more justice to the actual technology mm-hmm. and kind of jump in to what, what the secret sauce is here. Cause I feel like we've kind of, we were too excited. We went straight, we to went the, straight uh, from the intro <laughs> to, to the, so what? Yeah. Um, I think that there are four main ingredients, let's say to their sure. secret sauce, the technology they've got here. Um, and it, it kind of makes sense. It, it, there's a progression in the story. So the first ingredient they've got is active yarn. And this is what we're talking about here. It's a special type of thread that, almost acts like it's got muscles. So under certain stimuli, um, the fibers are able to shorten and under other different stimuli, they're able to stay long. And so in this case, they've specifically designed this active yarn to be specific toward um, localized extreme heat. So not the heat that you would experience in your washer or dryer, but they say, I think a 300 degree heat gun Mm -hmm. um, with very localized heat is what's able to cause these threads to shorten locally and that's how they're able to tailor it into a specific design. But the way that they get there is they take these active yarns and then they use a computerized knitting machine, which is a really smart machine. Um, and it basically, they've designed it in a way that when they knit the yarn, they're able to kind of predict 
when a heat stimulus is applied, how a certain garment might shrink in a certain area, right? So you don't want a garment to, garment to only shrink in length when heat is applied. You don't want something that's baggy and looks like a crop top, but you also don't want something uh, that only stretch or only shrinks laterally laterally yeah as opposed to longitudinally <laughs> yes. laterally right and and you've got like a really really skinny t-shirt but it's super long and it looks like you're wearing a giant sock um so what they've done is they've designed this knitting using the computerized knitting machine that allows them they they call it a four-dimensional stretch and four-dimensional shrink and stretch so they're able to get 3d stretch and shrink out of it but then they also are able to apply the heat to get that fourth dimension to get the shrinking um and the way that they apply this heat is the third ingredient in the secret sauce here, which is the robotic heat application. And it's a small robot, multi-axis robotic arm that moves around the body with a heat gun. Um, and it, think about it as like a really, really tiny hair dryer with concentrated heat. Um, when it heats up a part of the garment, the threads shrink a little bit, and that's how they're able to tailor the size to a specific person. And this part specifically, if you've watched Westworld um, and watched the multi-axis robotic robotic arms like weaving, weaving, forming a person or a robot, I guess, um, this looks very, very similar to that. And then the fourth secret part of the secret sauce, which I think kind of is the lifeblood that keeps everything together, is they've designed very specific software um, that controls the knitting machine controls the robot, basically allows them to start with a blank, um, start with the garment that it fits on the rack before it's been shrunk or anything, and then design for very specific outcomes regardless of the person's body shape. So, you know, multiple different body shapes, make sure that you're knitting and then shrinking the garment in a proper way that, you know, someone who's six foot six and 150 pounds, it fits them just as well as it fits someone who's five foot six and 150 pounds or who's four foot six and 150 pounds. Um, you know, every single person is sized and shaped differently and they're trying to make sure that this, you know, by way of trying to reduce waste, but also by way of trying to make sure that everyone can get a tailored fit. Um, they, they want to make sure that their one size fits all garment actually fits everyone as opposed to, I feel like a lot of one size fits alls are really one size fits none. Exactly. Exactly. And it's a, I'm happy you brought up the uh, the software that goes into making the sauce happen because there's a fun little story behind the robotic arm software specifically. They actually tagged in one of the students that was studying um, architecture mm-hmm. at MIT. And uh, that researcher was the one that was tasked with uh, coming up with the control software for this robotic arm. So they came in, no fashion experience, none of that. And they were like, hey, uh, could you help us out with like, specifically pointing this heat gun to get the desired geometry that we want um, out of this dress, which I think is pretty sick. Um, but yeah, with, with that said, I guess we, we already jumped into the so what. We're super excited about how it can be applied to dresses and suits and different articles of clothing to um, minimize waste and generate bespoke clothing really at a um, reasonable and scalable uh, level. So I, I want to talk about the scalable portion. Yeah. Uh, these folks at the Ministry of Supply have now over a decade of experience with manufacturing high high quality, high end clothing. And when asked about if they can produce this, they said we have the capability. We're just now waiting for the demand. So this uh, 4D weaving robot that they have to create the fabric, they are able to scale this to meet, I guess, based on what they're saying, whatever demand. Um, there is in the market. Well, and I think one thing that's interesting about weaving um, and making knitted clothing from a yarn, as opposed to um, maybe we were talking about suit jackets as an example, um, cutting that from a sheet of fabric is mm-hmm. also when you're knitting using yarn, there's, no waste. There, there's very little waste. Yeah. Um, there, there's not big s- scraps of fabric that get cut off and then you sew these scraps together. Um, you actually start with yarn and then the end product is this, you know, fully encompassing woven, in this case, they, they built a dress as their pr- proof of concept, woven dress um, without much waste at all, which again goes back to their um, their theme here, which is they're trying to minimize waste, democratize this perfect fit to everyone. Um, I thought that was an interesting way of attacking the first part, which is you're not going to have as many 
items that you have to keep in the rack. Um, people aren't going to throw their clothes away because it's actually going to fit them. Yeah. Um, and in the same way, even the manufacturing method, even though it's very scalable and it's w- able to be industrialized, uh, also doesn't come along with a lot of waste, which oftentimes when you're scaling something up from a production perspective, um, you end up with more and more waste as you get to the more and more industrialized processes. Um, and I thought that was pretty interesting as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I think one of the things I like when doing a little bit of research about Ministry of Supply was their commitment to um, being as environmentally friendly as possible. They make a note that since their founding, they've been carbon neutral. They make a point of saying that I believe their most popular items are created from recycled materials, Mm -hmm. 100%. uh, Because that's one thing I had in mind. I'm I'm very big on natural fibers just because, you know, it's easier on the earth. Um, It's easier to recycle. And I don't know how I feel about something that's completely composed of synthetic fibers, which allows us to do, you know, this level of formation and potentially minimize the waste. So it's like a, you know, you got to weigh the pros and cons. Mm -hmm. So seeing that, one of the companies leading this charge is um, very cognizant of environmental impact of the fashion industry. That's pretty nice to see. Yeah. And I think one cool twist that they mentioned here twist. that um, I didn't originally see coming, let's say, um, is I think at least in one way, this this idea works where they said, you know, as styles change and as fashions change um, someone could take their existing garment that they bought using the smart knit um, and then they could take it back into the store and be like oh like i actually i don't like the baggy fit that you gave me before um that's skin, so 2020 skin, yeah skinny pants are back in <laughs> can you make my baggy pants skinny and then they could apply the heat again which would turn these like new loose loose knit baggy pants into something that was more trim fitting um Similarly, they said if like someone's body changes size, you, you're you fortunate enough to lose a lot of weight. You don't have to go buy a whole new wardrobe yeah. again. You could take it back into the ministry supplier, whoever's selling it, um, and they could retailer it to your body. Um, they also talked about if someone liked their knit dress and they wore it all through the winter, but then now it's really hot outside and they wanted to wear something shorter in the, in the spring and summer, they could have this in there and it would, it would shrink the fibers again. So then they could go from wearing like this long knit dress into something that's like knee length and more comfortable. Obviously, I don't think it's reversible, so they can't apply a lot of localized cool yeah. um, and help our waistband stretch around the holiday season when we're always, always carrying a little bit extra holiday So unfortunate. Weight. But um, I did think that was interesting as well, just thinking about the drivers for what causes waste of clothing, yeah. um, changes in body, changes in style, changes in season. These, at least one way, right, making the garment smaller um, you don't experience as many of those uh, issues and drivers for for clothing waste, which again makes it awesome here. But I think ultimately the the driver that's going to make this most interesting for everyone, at least personally speaking, is like the ultimate perfect fit being accessible to, I agree. to just about anyone. Um, because even when I have a piece of clothing that like I'm not absolutely in love with in terms of design and maybe even quality, if it fits right, and he can kind of dude fit is everything it's everything um and i i I think that's that's what makes people so excited about having tailored clothes that's why people like dressing up and wearing a suit that fits well for sure that's why everyone's got that favorite t-shirt that's like a little bit too old and maybe it's a little bit worn out and maybe it's even got a hole in the armpit but it just fits right but it just fits right and that's like that's how i feel about the sweatshirt right now (laughs) is it i joke every time i put it on like nelly look at my brand new sweatshirt it looks nice and she's like dude, this is, it's seven years old. It's, it's maybe one of the older sweatshirts you own, but it fits right. Yeah. So I want to wear it all the time. I feel like being able to engineer that, and there are a bunch of engineers here, but be able to, being able to engineer that and provide that on a reliable basis to all your customers, as opposed to randomly, in my case, stumbling upon a sweatshirt in a gift shop in Cape Cod and being <laughs> like, wow, why does this fit perfectly? Um, I think that that's, probably the major benefit. And if they can truly replicate this perfect fit for everyone, um, I think that there's definitely going to be some challenges in terms of um, scaling robot arms with heat guns at scale in store or getting people comfortable to stand there while a robot with a heat gun is is operating near them. But if they're able to somehow overcome those barriers, I think that the, the perfect fit will be the selling point and all the you know reduction of clothing waste will just come as an awesome byproduct. Totally agree with you, man. And what a nice trip down memory lane to Cape Cod. Yeah. Yeah. Happy you mentioned that. Now <laughs> I want to go to Cape Cod. 
Uh, I think that's it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Can we wrap it up? Yeah, folks. Um, have you ever just had that T-shirt that you could not let go of? Well, you're not alone. Having a perfectly fitted article of clothing is difficult, especially given that if you do want something made to measure, it's pretty expensive usually. Well, these researchers at MIT um, have collaborated with Ministry of Supply, a fashion brand, to come up with a fabric that when heat treated with a robotic arm precisely can be the perfect article of clothing for anyone. That means they can take a dress off the rack, put it on you, and make it fit exactly the way you like. And this isn't even confined to dresses. It works on shirts, pants, whatever you want. And with this approach, they're hoping to really fight against fast fashion because now you're not really worried about your style, not being stylish anymore. You're not worried about throwing out your clothing because it doesn't fit right anymore. And you can minimize waste that comes from traditional manufacturing approaches. So it's a win, 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 win. And the best part is Ministry of Supply has actually said if there's demand for it, they can scale this up to whatever's required. So if this has got you hype, make sure you hit them up so we can all get this going. Yeah, exactly. I think strength comes in numbers here. Yeah. If they're if they see the demand for this type of product, it's definitely something that they're willing to scale and bring into reality, which would be awesome. Hey, if you're listening on Instagram, tag them. Yeah. It's the best way to get a movement going, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, before we wrap up, there is... Something that I want to mention. A passion plug? Uh, a little bit of a passion plug. Okay. But I also have something sad. Oh. But I think it's good, productive, constructive feedback. We recently got a review, uh, a one-star review. Oof, our first one. Uh, from Moogie98, who said, I see what they're trying to accomplish, but it's what every young engineer is talking about. The research seems okay, but they need to deep dive and actually talk about things that are working, not just the potential of new tech. And Moogie98, we appreciate your feedback. Absolutely. It's definitely something that we're going to work on and try and get better. And I think um, as immediate feedback, we are happy to share with you that we're trying to work more on being able to do deep dive interviews with the folks that we do cover on this podcast. So our short form 20 minute podcast episodes, we're going to follow those up. Um, similarly to the way we did, do you remember what episode it was with Machina? Oof. Give me a I feel sec. Like early 100s. Yeah. I think it was 150, Oof. episode 150. The interview um, or the actual episode? The interview. Okay. Uh, we covered Machina Labs in one of our early episodes on episode 118. And then we had the opportunity to follow up with the CEO of Machina in episode 150 and do a deeper dive on their technology Absolutely. and the story and why they think it's going to work. So appreciate your feedback, Moogie98. We're going to take that into account. And I, I think we're... If you're willing to stick along, we've got some uh, actionable feedback there. And we're going to go turn that into reality with a series of interviews with shakers and movers in the industry to give us that deep dive on technology that you're itching for. Yeah. And I'll, I'll add a little note. I think this um, approach of focusing on what's real and possible and doable versus the dreaming aspect of some of these um, academics or even industry folk, it's a tough balance for us to even hit. Because we do want to dream. We do want to believe that, you know, nuclear uh, fusion is possible within the next five years, just like it has been for the past 50 <laughs> years. Um, so I, I, I like to think we, we strive to keep a healthy balance of the moonshots and what's close and possible within the next year or two. But that's really good feedback. We'll try to add disclaimers on, I guess, our mindset and bring in those technical experts wherever we can. Exactly. And obviously, we hope you keep rocking with us long Absolutely. enough to see that stuff come to fruition. We love the one star just as much as we love the five stars. And I think as a um, the plus side of that, the other side of the coin is uh, our passion plug here. And folks, if you if you don't know yet, we're launching a podcast or Whoa, we already have a podcast. <laughs> We're launching a newsletter that accompanies the podcast. It's the Next Byte newsletter. It's going to deliver um, as much or more value that we feel this podcast is delivering to you through your ears, but then you'll be able to also get it through your eyes. Um, and for both mentions, there's a lot of times where he doesn't have time to listen to a 20 minute podcast episode. He just wants to be able to skim, in a, skim a newsletter for two, three minutes. Absolutely. And that's exactly what we've targeted here. We're, we're designing this newsletter to be skimmed, um, where you can get the tastiest, juiciest bits of the secret sauce from each interesting piece of technology that we cover on the podcast. 
but you'll be able to read it. Um, and we're excited about that. And we're excited to take, I wouldn't call it expertise, but maybe some of the skills that we've developed in communicating in technology, Verbally. making it accessible for people. Um, we're going to try and take the awesomeness that we've developed doing the podcast and make an awesome newsletter. So we'd appreciate it if you'd go sign up for our newsletter. You can go to the nextbyte.com and click on the button read and sign up. We'll also have a link for that directly in the show notes if you're interested. We would love to invite you as one of the founding readers of our newsletter. Yeah, and uh, as always, folks, thank you so much for listening, and we'll catch you in the next one. Peace. <laughs>